Hey guys, Jay here. Welcome to Models and Memories Weekly, episode 16. Models and Memories is a show about nothing and it is filmed in front of a live studio audience. And stay tuned all the way till the end to see a montage of painted minis courtesy of the EOB Complete community. Models and Memories is a show where I talk about my painting, modeling, and wargaming experiences from the week and I end every episode with a story. Now you might be thinking to yourself, Jay, you live stream every single night and put out three YouTube videos a week. How could you possibly have more to say? Well, I do. And here it goes. This week, I got tons of professional painting done, but only a little bit of personal painting, but it was a really fun project. I painted this little praying mantis doctor scientist. I was in a little bit of a slump between projects, and so I decided I'm going to sit down and I'm going to paint a mini. Start to finish, I'm going to cut corners, I'm going to make it a fast paint job, and I also want an excuse to play with this new camera I have. But it turned out really, really fun. I think a lot of that is due to the sculpt. I love simpler characters that have a lot of uh, fun things going on. I mean, he's pretty, he's got robot parts, he's got a nice little cloak, and he has a bug head, which is super fun. And this really reminded me of one of my all time favorite games, FTL, Faster Than Light. It is a roguelike game where you're flying in a spaceship and you just come across random enemies to attack. But one of the crew members you can have is a Mantis. And their special ability is they're a little quicker. They're really bad at fixing things, but they're really good in fights. And so maybe this, maybe this is exactly what they look like on that little ship. A cute little uh, Professor Mantis. Because of how quickly I put together this paint job, I actually put together my palette ahead of time, which is a good practice to do, but I often don't. I often just uh, pick up colors as I feel like I need them. But there is something to be said for giving yourself a limited palette to start with. I painted uh, really everything but his head with blue, a dark gray, and a white. And that was it. And I think it actually was kind of fun. It took it took away a lot of the guesswork and it made sure that when it came time to put the greens and yellows and reds on his head, his head has all of the visual interest because the rest is just different shades of gray. 50 shades of gray to be exact. I think another reason that this project was so invigorating is because this is the first time in a little bit of a long time I painted something purely just to paint something, not to add a unit to my army, not to get something done for a video. This was just a pure, I have a little Mantis figurine, let's paint him up and put him on the shelf to look at. And I really, really had a fun time. I think I should try to do that more often. Find a nice balance, you know, paint paint a squad of Space Marines, you know, paint, paint a little Mantis friend, you know, paint, paint 25 skeletons, you know, paint a pug. I think I think a little balance can, uh, can help keep everything exciting and interesting. And I mean, this this brought up some fun painting challenges and you never know I, uh, I had to paint an iPad screen because he's holding an iPad. You never know when that skill might come in handy. On his bug eyes, I tried out doing some spots of white, which was nerve wracking after I did a nice yellow blend on his eyeball to be like, all right, it looks really good. Now let's go in there with just a dot of white and see what happens. There's no going back, but I think it looks really nice. I am very happy with my little mantis friend. And I, I know when I really love a paint job because this guy follows me around now that he's finished. And this is a pretty common thing. I'm sure you guys do it too. Where you know, you're like, ah, finish this paint job, time to go make dinner. So you put this guy on the counter just so that you can look at him a little bit more while you're while you're making dinner or feeding the dogs. Eventually, eventually that, that wears off and he goes on the shelf and I look at him from time to time. But uh, you know, when he's finished, you know, brushing the teeth, looking at the fella. But another thing I found really interesting about this guy is he's a 3D print, but he's actually a pretty solid 3D print. I'm sure some of that comes down to the shop I bought him from being excellent at uh, printing, but also I think a little bit of it comes down to the sculpt. The details are a little bit soft compared to something like a Games Workshop Mini, but I think I don't think that hurts it at all. I think it's still very nice. It looks a lot like a PVC figure but uh, I really, really like him. And I decided to throw him on one of these Necromunda bases I have laying around. And this got me thinking about 3D prints because I actually did a lot of shopping this week for 3D prints. And I was looking around and if you don't own a printer and you don't want a printer, actually 3D prints are not that easy to come by for a, for a good price. I was shopping around on Etsy and Etsy is pretty pricey. 
Uh, you know, Etsy takes a little that little cut, and uh, shipping is you know it's gonna hit you hard with Etsy. I looked around on eBay, which eBay was pretty good, but it's the the quality is just complete shot in the dark. Um, I've done some other things in the past, like there's this company Shapeways that will 3D print stuff for you. And the tricky thing with Shapeways, they're also a little pricey, but the way that they print fine detail stuff is not the perfect way for miniatures. The current resin printers on the market do a pretty good job. You might get a little layer lining, but you get something very akin to a regular old resin miniature. It's pretty smooth. The details are pretty crisp. The thing with the Shapeways high, high quality printers is I think they use some like a wax system uh, where they, they put resin into a wax matrix and it is the perfect way if you want to print something uh, small with perfect tolerances every time, which is often what people do on Shapeways because people are doing a lot of prototyping. They're doing a lot of like uh, like product stuff. It's not as much just for fun. A lot of jewelry gets done that way. And if you know, if you need your rhinestones to perfectly inset the first time every time, I mean, you probably want crispy tolerances. But for us miniature gamers, uh, the problem with that method is it does create a little crinkly texture to the surface of all the prints. I bought a bunch of Death Watch shoulder pads and once the paint was on and once the wash was on, you could totally see. I mean, those Death Watch shoulder pads, they have text on them, but uh, it was a little, the detail was good, but it was a little bit like sandpapery texture. It's not perfect. And so as someone who doesn't have a 3D printer, doesn't really want a 3D printer, doesn't, I don't want to deal with it. I don't want the hassle. I don't want the goo. I don't, I only want to be painting. I will, I will pay the money so that somebody else can make a perfect model out of plastic resin or metal or whatever. And then that comes to me and I just open it up and I'm, I'm painting. That's what I want. I don't want to, I don't want to finagle on the computer and then tell the machine to print it. And then the printer makes it up and then I'm taking a putty knife and trying to chip it off and then uh, putting it out in the sun or whatever you have to do to get it ready. Get off the supports. I've had I've had to uh, take some supports off of 3D prints before and it can be a challenge. And I actually do have a fair bit of experience with 3D printing with plastic 3D printing. When I was in architecture school, I 3D printed tons of stuff, mostly architectural thingies. And that actually interests me a little more. Um, 3D printing with the plastic because you can actually make some really cool, big, strong stuff. When I was young, I did a lot of props and costumes and cosplay. And I mean, 3D printers are perfect for that now. Whereas back in the day, it's, you know, you're, you're chipping away at wood or you're making it out of plastic or foam. But I think, you know, 3D print is printed perfectly every single time. But I don't know about uh, 3D printed miniatures if you don't have a printer. If you have a printer, I guess it's as easy as finding a Patreon or some place to get STLs and then you, you print them. Although even that I find a little bit challenging. When I was shopping around for certain, the 3D prints that I was looking for, you know, I would punch in the thing and then there would be 10 shops all selling that thing. And so that gives me two challenges. Number one, which is a legitimate shop and which isn't? Like which is someone who just ripped a bunch of STLs, has them on their computer, and will print them for you because there's something a little scummy about that. A lot of people have the appropriate permission to uh, print and sell other people's STL designs, but I know a bunch of people don't. And there's a bunch of things that people, you know, out of the kindness of their hearts or because of the love of the hobby, they have designed and put that STL out there for free. And I feel like even though they put it out there for free, expecting people to use that STL for free, I think it's a little scummy to take that STL and then try to make money off of it. I've sent out blasts of emails before from uh, from potential businesses I wanted to buy 3D prints from to say, hey, is this company a legitimate seller of your products? And I've gotten back emails that say, yes, absolutely. They have permission from us to sell. And I've gotten emails that say, no, that we don't recognize them. We don't know who they are. And it's hard. It puts a lot of onus on me to figure this out because I don't want I don't want any feel bad situations. I don't want to help somebody else profit off of designs that they didn't they, they don't have permission to use. But I kind of just want the cool thing. <laughs> and so it's hard. It's hard to weigh the OK, I found some shops that look like they have good quality. Um, some of them, but some of them don't have, you know, that permission stamp or that permission stamp doesn't looks a little fishy to me. 
Like I've seen, I've seen some stores say, you know, thank you blank for the models. What does thank you mean? Does thank you mean, yes, we've spoken back and forth money or, you know, some sort of a contract has changed hands. I have permission or does thank you mean, thank you, original artist. Now I sell Batman, you know, statues. So it's, it's, it, it's a weird situation. I wish, I wish that there was some sort of a way to uh, like properly copyright your STL work. I mean, STLs are tiny. You can send them in emails. They're, they're, they're nothing. They're, they're, they're like vector files. But uh, it's tricky. 3D prints are tricky. Because I, I know what, I feel like I know what's going on. I'm willing to put in the legwork to try to make sure that I am only buying stuff from registered sellers. But I totally get it if someone either doesn't know or doesn't really care and just wants the cool thing. You know, I want an Iron Man helmet. Go find the Iron Man helmet. It's, it's hard to be like, you shouldn't do that. It's, it's hard. It's really hard. It's also really hard when there's so many people printing, printing stuff for sale. I guess you just have to find your guy and always go with them. I've, I've bought from a few different places and some places have given like, have given me great service, but okay prints. And some places have given me like bad service, but really good prints. It's tricky. It is really tricky. I remember one time I, I sent a, a company on Etsy an email saying like, oh, I really am happy with your products. The only thing I noticed was a little, a little layer shifting on one sword. And I was just, I just said that to make them aware. I didn't, I, I could totally fix it. And they sent, they sent a bunch of models back. They were like, oh, I'm, I'm we're so sorry. And I'm like, I, I didn't even, I, I was just complimenting you guys. I didn't even try to be mean, but thank you. But, uh. 3D prints, it's a weird and wacky world. But unless 3D printers get real, real easy, I don't think I'm jumping, I'm jumping in. It, it just looks like a hassle. It looks like, it, it, it looks like it could be fun, but it looks like so much time that I could be spending painting some of the many, many models I have. Because really, even if I, if I stop looking at all of the wonderful 3D sculpts out there, there's still so much regular old fashioned plastic, pewter and uh, resin out there that I have all the minis that I could possibly want at my fingertips. So what do you guys think about the whole 3D printing debacle? Do you think that it is your prerogative to try to make sure that you are only buying from, from registered sellers and you try to try to force out all of the leeches and all of the, uh, the little pop-up black market shops? Or do you think that it's it's totally up to the consumer to find whatever price that they want to pay, and it's up to the original designers and manufacturers to figure out on their end how they're gonna keep track of their own business? It is tricky. I bet I bet one day they come up with something where you can you can have a lock on your STL. Like maybe you have a lock on your STL, and then once that is given to the person who wants to purchase the STL, they get a code to unlock it once or for a day or something, it'd be tricky. I don't know exactly how it would work, but I bet there's gonna be something. But this isn't primarily a 3D printing channel, it's a wargaming channel, and we usually do wargaming content. And if you like that content, the best way to support us is by becoming a member of our Patreon. Over there, you'll get access to a ton of stuff. You get behind the scenes, you get a song parody. It's really good. You get a live hobby hangout every week, you get to pick what I paint live on YouTube every night. By the way, I stream live on YouTube every night from nine to 10 p.m. Central and a whole bunch of other stuff as well. But that is what I did this week. It was a really big week, but I can't tell you guys about it yet. It is still coming in videos that you're not gonna wanna miss. But now it is time for the story. And this show is called Models and Memories because of the association between models and memories. I am gonna remember forever all the things that I was doing while I was painting this mantis. And that idea is the same for objects. As you can see behind me on my YouTube set, there's tons of objects and every single one has a story behind them. In fact, an awful lot of these you heard the stories about. So this week I am gonna talk about This, this is one of my most prized possessions, an Amazon box. But inside this box is a project that I have been working on for years. 
and I'm not gonna tell you what it is yet. Some of you will probably pick up on what this is, and if you do, please leave a comment. I'll give you a hint, I started this project in 2015. If you leave a comment, please leave a comment saying if you figured it out or not, and even if you don't figure it out before I spoil it, just go ahead and pretend like you did, because it's a lot of fun. It's real dusty, this has been in my garage. We got some, I believe these are the front bumper skids off of a Datsun. We have the dial switches from a galvanometer, I wanna say. This one is more complete than this one, but they'll both get the job done. Two car horns. I have, so it broke in transit. Yeah, a Datsun, the, uh, the little tag on a Datsun car. And lots and lots of spark plugs. <laughs> and lots and lots of spark plugs. I have an affinity for objects and I also have an affinity for film props and one prop that I love above all else is from a movie that I love above all other movies. And that is, drum roll please, Mad Max Fury Road. And one day I want to build the guitar from Mad Max Fury Road, the flamethrower guitar. Coma the Doof Warriors flamethrower guitar from Mad Max Fury Road. And the cool thing about it is it was made from found objects. There was nothing manufactured specifically for that prop. And so all of the, if I can get a hold of all of the components, I can just build a guitar. I can build a perfect replica. And so I have, I have dozens and dozens and dozens of screenshots from the movie. I've blown them up huge. I've tried to identify every single part. I have spreadsheets, I have documents, and I have been every now and then trying to acquire more and more of the components. Some of the big stuff, like once I got a hold of these, I knew I could make the part because these these are probably one of the trickier parts to get a hold of. I love it. They're all beat up and dented too. It just adds to the realism. And one day I need to get a a uh, like a World War II steel bedpan because that is what they made the body of the guitar out of. There's one more really linchpin part that if I can get a hold of that, this project can go ahead. And that is a euphonium, a four trigger silver euphonium, and. That is really put the kibosh on this for now because that is a very expensive musical instrument. I don't need all of it, I need like the guts of it, but that's kind of the important part of the instrument anyway. So one day, one day I'll be able to track that down. But, and so my dream, my dream is little by little over the course of years, I want to assemble all of the components and then one day I will weld it and rivet it and pop rivet it and bolt it all together and then I will have a working perfect replica. I think that the real filming prop actually fired gasoline but I think I'm gonna have mine shoot out gas because it's a little safer and it's very much easier to purge gas lines uh, and have them safe for storage than it is gasoline lines. But this project super duper inspires me with joy and interest and intrigue and it's just gonna be so much fun. I'll have to figure out how to mill perfect holes in these Datsuns, uh, Datsun bumper plates so that I can mount in all of the spark plugs. I even found out that they're not all normal spark plugs. These, these are perfectly average spark plugs, but I needed four of these. This is a champion number seven. I believe that this is a spark plug for a motorcycle, for a very specific uh, era of motorcycles, and so I have four. And so one day, I wanna have everything, I wanna have it built, I wanna have it nice, and then I actually want to make a stunt version. Now, I don't believe there was a stunt version from the film. I think in every scene you can see the guitar, it is the real guitar. But I love, in movies, the, the hero prop versus the stunt prop, and so I want to uh, figure out how to build the guitar for real. And then I want to cast a lot of the key components in resin and then build replicas and then stunt versions. I think the stunt version is mostly gonna be for me because I wanna see if I can do it. And I would love to see 
If I could build another version out of foam and rubber and paint it to perfectly match the real object, but I would also maybe like to recoup some of my losses, and so that's why I might actually also uh, sell castings of this guitar. I haven't seen online, I've seen online a bunch of people build this, but I haven't seen anyone get it exactly right yet, and I want to be the one who builds it exactly right. And I'm so far, I'm in a good place. I have some of the more tricky components, but I don't have everything yet. But that's okay, because this is a project that I expect to take 10 more years at least before uh, I really, because I don't devote really any time to this. Every now and then I'll peruse eBay or something, but that's kind of the fun. This is a project that I can have on the back burner forever. I can always fall back on it if I want to. Really, that's where the joy is coming from. Not if I finish it, that'll be incredible and amazing and wonderful, but just the fact that it exists and I have the documentation and I have a cardboard box sitting in the garage covered in cobwebs, it really sparks a lot of joy. I don't think that this stuff will be making any more appearances on the channel, but please do let me know if you'd be interested in seeing any sort of videos on props, like 40K props or cosplays or costume stuff like that, because I'm very equipped to do it. I just don't know if it would get the clicks and it would be really, really hard content to pull off. But if you guys really, really want it, I can give it a try. Really, the best way to get stuff like that happening is with becoming a member of our Patreon. But that is my Mad Max guitar. I'm not seeing a couple of objects. I'll have to take another peruse and see if those are laying around anywhere. But it's still looking great. And ah, it's exciting to have them all out again. Mad Max Fury Road, I remember seeing it in 2015 with one of my all time best friends and we both were completely blown away by the movie. Mad Max Fury Road is gotta be one of the best films ever made. The visual storytelling. I mean, I think you could probably fit every spoken line of dialogue in that movie in like three paragraphs. There's almost no words, but the whole movie is told through actions. It is the magnum opus from the brilliant mind of George Miller, the visionary director who has given us such films as Happy Feet and Babe 2, Pig in the City. But he also made all of the other Mad Max movies. And you know what? All of the other Mad Maxes are great in their way, but I think that they have been definitely overshadowed by the brilliance of Mad Max Fury Road. So that is the story this week. That'll wrap it up for this episode of Models and Memories. But now it's time for what you've all been waiting for. Really, you don't care about any of this. I know what you all want. You want to see this week's EOB Complete submissions. We put out a challenge to our community to send us before and after photos of their recently finished models to be immortalized in our videos. If you want to join in the fun, you can submit a before and after photo of your painted mini to our Discord server, which you can find in the description below, or you can post it to Instagram with the hashtag EOB Complete. Without further ado, let's look at and get inspired by what the folks have finished this week. An Ultramarine Sergeant by Bob Derbaum, a Primaris Chaplain by Aldous, a Thousand Suns Demon Prince by Orange, a Zhu Jing Jansi from Infinity by Frozen Throg, a Barney the Purple Dinosaur by Sparkling Squid, some Necron Immortals by Psycho Babble, some Blade Guard Veterans by Unity, some Plant Monsters by Gustavo S, a Longfang Veteran by King Snagarian, a Sister of Battle by Dark Lord Bowdish, a Neon Demon by Doozran, an Inquisitor by CJ Boy, a Leap of Rage by Disco, a Necron Doomstalker by Alex Ryder123, an Orc Megabox by Fang of Sotek, a Sylvaneth Archer by Paolati, an Eldar Farseer by Player Sionan, a Tau Battlesuit by Snakus, a Primaris Tech Marine by Lucifer Hawk, a Chaos Lord by Talkative Turtle, a Lord Commander Dante by Smug Dylan, a Chaos Terminator by Belacor, a Herald of Slanesh by Joe Dracos, a Space Marine Captain by Misho, some Primaris Outriders by Huntron, a Primaris Deathwing Lieutenant by Barge, a Magos Dominus by Titania, some Adeptus Mechanicus Iron Strider Bellistari by Boba Fett IG-88, an Orc Blood Bowl player by Theron, and the Hunter from Zona by Ed Scar. Congratulations to everyone for a job well done. It's no small feat to get paint on minis and you all should feel really proud. Nothing gets the hobby juices flowing like finishing a project and we all thank you for sharing your work, motivating us and the hobby community to paint our plastic. Thanks for sharing. 